Welcome to the second of the afternoon talks, which will be in the Congo room, which will be Richard talking about optimizing pipes. Hello? Thanks, so you can hear me, I guess. Um, so I'm here to tell a little bit about PyPy in general, and I would like to focus how you probably can gain of using PyPy. Um, my name is Richard, I'm quite new to the project. If you know PyPy, you have not seen me by now, but I hope I can stick around not long. So you end up here, what could you expect or what would I like to give you? So you can see it as an approach how you could optimize Python programs, right? Um, and normally PyPy developers do this do that by explaining the just in time compiler. So I try to step back a little from that and motivate the whole thing a bit more on a business side of perspective, meaning what's the value for you when you use PyPy. And I have three examples and I hope some of them you will like. Um, and also maybe you can take away how you should not start optimizing your program. <laughs> anyway, that's opinionated, that's debatable. So, um, you know RevDB, if you stick here around the last session, which is an awesome tool in my opinion. So, summing up from my point of view, what is PyPy? It's a fast virtual machine for Python programs. And we're like a big community with including researchers, freelancers, and many contributors building this piece of software. Um, as Armin said at the last talk, basically we would only like to provide you with some tools that you switch and your program suddenly runs faster because there's a lot of thinking going into the project. Um, but I mean, I could stop now and say, do this and everything will, will be fine. No, <laughs> but it will probably not work. Um, you can get a lot more if you pay attention. Um, and by that I mean you pay attention to what your program is doing and you have the right tools to inspect them. Piper is not just that, right? We have seen RevDB and there is a lot of other projects that have come out um, the last 13 years, something like that. And it was like started to be an ex a tool for experimenting. And I mean, th this history is not ordered, but to give you kind of an idea, it was like writing a Python interpreter in Python. Well, obviously, what's the result of this? It's slow. Then time was invested to enhance this, which is called our Python. It's basically a tool chain, which are we used for RevDB, which we use for the JIT compiler, which we use for the software transaction and memory version of PyPy. Um, so these are all projects with good ideas, some of them not complete, um, and we, we're happy that we have these tools basically. So if you have a great idea, you should come by and maybe check out PyPy. So, it's about time to introduce me a little bit more. So I've um, working on PyPy like one and a half years now. I finished my master's thesis on uh, optimization using some special instruction set of x86 CPUs, which was backed by a Google sum of code, and I kind of stick around with PyPy. Um, and I'm currently living in Austria and working there. And I'm, I have to say I'm very happy to work on PyPy because I think it's really awesome project. Speed, speedy Python programs. When, when is a Python program really fast? And I mean, I do not really seriously put this question because um, I would go the other way around. You have a problem because it's slow, right? So you want to change something. So when it's fast enough, maybe because it got a speeding ticket because it's too fast. <laughs> And by that I mean, basically, that people spend time optimizing stuff that's not worth it, and they brag about it all the time. But, I mean, what's the point? Point being, at least my point, is that you sh should spend time on solving problems. And the other one is, well, at some point, maybe we reach 10 times faster than C-Python. Is that the right goal? I don't think so. I mean, 
it's always a matter of those in my opinion is you run your program and you have some kind of criteria you, you measure gain value um, depending on what you're reaching out so for example most of the time people think of CPU time spending time in arithmetic loading memory um, whatnot or peak memory of your program which Python uh, sometimes uh, takes a lot request a second latency um, I, have, I will cover all of these three aspects of peak memory um, so the dissatisfaction should drive your optimization because then you will end up with a better program much faster than optimizing uh, non-existing non-existing problems basically so let's jump in um, I would like to do some theory uh, how many of you have studied computer science or something that has to do with programming? Okay, most of you. So I will not so much bore you with complexity, but I think it's a very useful thing to think when you optimize a program, right? Um, so it's, the idea is to classify a function. The bigger the input, what, what, how does it rank? Um, and I mean, you could go through this, but it's kind of obvious that you kind of measure what's the worst time you can spend in these loops or in the program or in the function, right? So if you get this idea by just um, looking at your program, um, you finally maybe come to the conclusion that it's better to have lower complexity of your algorithm. Um, and the point I would like to make is the most gain you can get if you have complexity that is very low. So, for instance, bubble sort is 2 to the power of 2, n to the power of 2, versus quick sort, which is n to the logarithm of m, n. Um, which one would you take? Obviously, quick sort. Not because they teach you that in university, but if you stuff a lot of data into the algorithm, it will perform much faster, right? So, you should always optimize low complexity basically and if you can find uh, some optimization that will lower your complexity it will be language independent it doesn't really matter if you are uh, in assembler or python that's really the most game so that's about it for a more theoretical point of view so let's get down to real let's say business a small example that the project I've been working on for PyPy, we have a tool for inspecting what the thing is doing at runtime. Um, this tool has been around uh, before my time, and what I did, I moved this tool to the web uh, because it's much easier. We nobody needs to set it up, right? And what it does, it parses log files and hands them out to the browser. Fine. Um, it's written in Python. It's available at this URL. Um, and it's very easy to get big log files because we constantly produce uh, optimized uh, loops and other parts of the program. So, of course, they're written in Python because the value is I'm fast. I, I spent like, I don't know, a day for getting a lot of details um, settled, and it's very uh, easy to test, right? So that's really value and obviously it's linear complexity because the input size dictates how many memory you allocate out of the log. Um, so we should be good in complexity. Um, that's what I mentioned earlier, little development time and easy to test. That's really the killing features of Python in my opinion. Or I mean you could go beyond that and say dynamic languages give you just that, which is incredible. But it takes a long to parse, like 10 seconds for 40 megabytes. That's not, that's not really performant, right? And of the second motivation why there need to be some changes, parsing is done per request, okay? So our criteria is CPU time is too long, and the request per second is really awful. So people complained, tickets going into GitHub, 
And I thought, okay, let's, let's do something. Um, and my suggestion would be caching and reduce CPU time, and let's have both. So caching is probably the easiest one, right? So you prepare it in memory and just hand out small parts of your program, which is really easy. I mean, you, you just have to find your favorite framework and then uh, cache it and deliver the results, right? There is some catch with this. If I uh, used Django for this at, um, in the beginning, and the issue being it uses pickle to save the object in memory. So it's like be making some copy, um, a dense chunk of memory and reload it. And it's like we have 100 megabytes of data structures in RAM, right? So that takes ages. <laughs> um, so I ended up doing it myself, which was rather easy. Anyway, the, the biggest gain is reducing CPU time. And I hope you believe me, if you run it this way, see Python, I mean, that's not the executable, just to give an idea which version I used, it took 10 seconds. If you put here, if you bump the two and remove the seven, it's like 14 seconds. <laughs> um, and Piper did it in just two seconds which is crazy, right? It's like five times. Um, and I think that's a very good documentation of being lazy, right? And the caching had the effect that the request read instant, because as soon as you load it one time, uh, you, you just read memory. Um, so now two seconds probably is too large. For my opinion, um, the first step for optimizing this program has been done. Uh, if that's not enough, for me it's enough because two seconds for this kind of problem uh, is fairly, it's fairly good in my opinion. Um, there's no pain anymore, nobody's complaining, so problem solved, right? But there is of course more, and that's the point where VMProf comes into play. It basically um, a profiling utility which doesn't slow down your program. Um, I will jump in the tabs. I would like to explain this a little bit. So that is like a screenshot of what you see online at vamprof.com. So you are run your program, as you've seen here, um, using this module and upload it to the web basically what you do, and uh, the performance decrease is like 3%, uh, what I have experienced, so it's really not noticeable. And what it does is, over the, of the span of your program lifetime, um, it interrupts um, very frequently and samples your stack. So what you get is um, a history of stack traces, and you, you can, for instance, combine them in such a visualization like a flame graph, so um, obviously, if you spend a lot of time in your program in this function, you would have more samples, right? And with this tool, you can browse them, which is really neat. So if Piper, using Piper itself is not enough, you can just um, start to click around here and see where, where time is spent. And for instance, in this file, uh, it is file at uh, line ele 11, there's probably some issue. Um, generally, it's obvious to me why there's so much time spent because the most thing we record are operations which are done by our chip compiler and we allocate objects out of it. So I mean, that's really bounded by allocation and reading uh, from the log. Um, so you can click around, and this, for instance, is the Piper version, which has a slightly different coloring, meaning you can't read it on the left-hand side, meaning red is interpreted, is patching the Python or byte code loop. Um, the green one is obviously the one you would like to spend your time. So it's really reduced to a set of instructions, and I think now is a good time to a little bit explain how this all comes together. Hotspots. 
set loop or repeat construct. Um, what kind of program can you build without loops? In my opinion, that's not a lot you can do. For instance, video streaming, you cannot do it because there is no loop. You can, at most, read a fixed size image or convert every pixel, but you cannot resize it without changing the program, which is, which is bad. So obviously, most times it are spent in loops. And the simplified view of optimization, which is done by Pipeway, is basically to start off in slow, that's fine, and loop trigger recording. So it's like saying, well, I've seen this loop, I've seen this loop many, many times, and the hotter it gets, it will say, well, now's a good time to record every operation. And finally leading into some kind of optimization step, um, generating, generating machine code. Um, and it really, the interesting, in my opinion, the interesting stuff is happening while optimizing. And that's the perception I get back from many people. How does the chicken compiler work? Magic. <laughs> Um, I do kind of disagree because, I mean, there are nice tricks, but you need to spend a lot of time to understand them, right? But it's not, not magic. Um, and I, I would like also to give you a picture that's basically the visualization of the log. Um, I've... Sorry, I need to switch here. Okay, sorry. My screen is too small, so it which is the mobile view, so you cannot watch it. Anyway, what I wanted to show you is this kind of visualization. Let's take this one. So this line in the middle is basically the loop. Um, boiling down to some instructions. So you enter here and unpack data from your Python frame, from a Python <coughs> stack frame. Um, and you cannot see it, but below it would be include the, the operations. Um, so it's kind of, instead of interpreting, you very specifically look at instructions. Um, and here are some tricks which are pretty neat in my opinion, so like pep specialization. Um, if you add integers, right, they are objects, so they are unpacked, the computation is done, and they are packed again, right? So you, you obviously you want to get rid of this, and that's not a limiting factor, probably not in the JIT log, but doing arithmetic quite often is a bit uh, stressing in terms of CPU time. So what you would, would like to do is either unbox the object, which is also done, or you specialize the type, um, which for instance helps you when you do function calls. So one thing is you inline the function, so there is, you do not need to push a stack frame. Um, what else? We have a different GC uh, scheme, um, which gives a little bit of trouble sometimes because deletion of object is delayed, but it will less work in general, which is good. So you see, we kind of try to bend in reality and see, like, um, we do not, the idea is kind of, in GCC, people help themselves by saying, well, this is undefined behavior, so I will optimize it, right? So we do kind of the same thing, but try not to be that aggressive and more uh, transparent, in my opinion. So let's switch um, to another. Uh, example. Um, there is a company called Magnetic, which are doing mar is a marketing tech company, and I've had a little discussion with him how he perceives using pipeline production. And they switched to it three years ago because they had obviously issues, right? So, um, what does your service do? Basically, this company sends target uh, targeting ads. So. And also they have some kind of fancy algorithm to uh, find out which ad would be the most fitting for this connection. And um, 
let's see where where was it most helpful and they reported three years ago that's like 30 percent speed up immediately from switching from pi by red which is really cool in my opinion because that's the most lazy approach for scaling your server and in my opinion software is technology it's not only switching hardware and often it's the cheaper one but i mean that's my point of view um, what are the issues they faced um, they had to solve their own deploys um, and he claimed but that's also okay for him because it's fairly easy what was a kind of an issue is um, if you re-switch the whole service um, at one point in time um, Piper will be slow at the beginning because it will look at the program and start recording that requires obviously more time than just doing computations um, and, and suddenly when you what is called is warm, warmed up all the traces remember that the picture I showed you are there then it's really really fast the issue is that if you head into the wrong direction and you produce traces and traces and traces like a list of operations all the time um, obviously you spend a lot of time not on your program so that's a kind of issue where you might want to change your program a little bit and this tool I showed you can help you to do that I mean if switching to Piper is not enough you can look into it which is cool continuing with this example so what's the value to your company um, and he was saying like well the latency was only 10 percent but it's it's not it's a deceiving number because it's very valuable and he was claiming that uh, was serving like half a million requests and most of the time is spent blocking so they wait for database requests anyway so 10 percent is pretty good actually because you just root through the program and maybe do some computation um, and the rest is like weighted so you don't see any improvement cool so he was quite happy um, what else oh, I think that's, that's fine let's switch a bit topic um, time it who have used it to do micro benchmarking um, well uh, use perf really use perf um, the point being we have currently just yesterday this commit went into our, uh, into our SPM system so time it behaves differently under PyPy we now do not return the minimum but the average right so why would you like to do that and the point being is if you micro, micro benchmark you can obviously hit some sweet spots and if the minimum is far away from your average uh, time of your loop you will think well um, my program is very good because uh, it returns very quickly but it is not true because in reality the user will wait much longer for the request to be completed so it's a bug tracker um, uh, still bot anyway so try it out on PyPy and I'm really eager to <laughs> see some tickets opening in our bug tracker because we changed that <coughs> as Armin said I want to switch a bit about what's going on with PyPy so, since I'm reaching the end of my talk um, we progressed quite a bit um, I've mentored the async IO uh, uh, module basically the changes with students which was quite nice this year and we have many small details we are missing so if you want we can work a little bit on, uh, on that in the sprint um, CPy extensions is also we have some good news on that because NumPy is really reaching like two digit test, test failures um, and if you don't know why that's an issue for us we have to maintain two, two types of objects like the PyPy one with its own garbage collection scheme and the CPython ones which connect to each other and need to be allocated um, and deallocated correctly Right. 
So let's that's my closing example. Um, a bit fast, I think, but that's fine. I'll search a bit around. Um, how can they use PyPy? How did they succeed? And this guy really, I like this example. Um, he basically runs software which extracts extracts data from a database and does a lot of computation, right? So um, that's basically the stack he built up. He uses PyPy, various libraries, various libraries, um, uh, Python libraries, and databases, obviously, and with C Python, that was five years ago. That's like, not like a new example, it's five years ago. He went from 12 megabytes to 100 megabytes, which limited, was limited the network, which is really crazy in my opinion. So his feedback to us was, if Piper lots of memory, he do Piper lots of time to warm up, and you won't be sorry. <laughs> anyway, with that, I want to thank you, you can contact me. And I'm happy to answer any questions you would, you would like to ask. Thank you. All right, any questions? Thank you.